Dorcas the Daisy. By the way, I have had so much fun with this study. Um, I had told God a few years ago that I wasn't going to write homework anymore, that I was done with that. And then um, God has opened this door up. Audrey's laughing with me because, you know, you can never tell God you're done with something. And um, this study came up, and there's a group of Facebook that have been doing our studies nationwide. And there's like three, 400 gals that have been doing it, and we wanted to sync them together with you. And so now, after the teaching, these gals can join us, but they also can do the homework with us by going to Uversion. So instead of printing copies like we always used to, you could go to Uversion, they can go to Uversion, and we will all make one big happy family in some kind of virtual reality. And I guess that's just what life is. So part of um, having this community that is growing beyond our borders is you need connective tissue. You know, if they can be studying what you're studying, it makes them feel more a part of us. And uh, so thus, the Lord said, would you just try to write some homework? And I'm like, I'll try it, but if I don't like it, I'm not doing it. And then it just kind of like poured out of me. So this is an endorsement for going to you version and doing the homework with us. If you go on, Daisy came up live this last week, so you can catch up and study that. And then, of course, we'll be coming up with those that follow. And part of this study is discovering significance. Do you feel significant? Ladies have a hard time with that. Um, because that is something we all wrestle with. And somehow we put our identity and our significance in different things. I was talking to Skip about this. I said, men generally try to find their significance in what they do, their jobs. Yes, that's why they work so much. Unless they start golfing and then it's all over. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> and, and women tend to find their identity in relationships. And so sometimes we get so deep into that, we lose our identity. I'm not just Mrs. Skip Heitzig, and I'm not just Nathan's mom. I'm Lenya Heitzig, and I have my own identity. And I can tell you, sometimes people try to get to know me to be Skip's wife and not Lenya. And you can tell the difference, can't you? When someone is their, not their authentic self. Well, how would you like to live every day of your life with a deep sense of meaning. Yeah. Amen, sister. The opposite is insignificance. This is where days turn into years, turn into a lifetime of monotony that you feel like a robot, like that Dunkin' Donut guy. Do you remember him? They're going to show you. Time to make the donuts. Dunkin' Donuts are always fresh. I made the donuts. We make them at least twice every day. Time to make the donuts. Not a few kinds, like supermarkets. I made the donuts. Time to make the donuts. But up to 52 varieties. The donuts. <laughs> Time to make the donuts. I made the donuts. Dunkin' Donuts, up to 52 varieties, fresh day and night. No supermarket can say that. You know, there are some days where I'm like, time to do the laundry, and it's never ending. I don't know about you, but it is never ending in our house, or whatever it is, it's time to do that, and we find that it's just like, is this all there is? This is it? This is what I would, you know, time to change the sheets, time to change the diaper, time to whatever it is, and you're like, I'm not finding a whole lot of significance in some of these things. Psychologists tell us that humans at their core crave three vital things. Number one, safety. Number two, belonging. And number three, significance. Safety is paramount. You're not going to do anything if you don't feel safe, right? So you just need safety or you won't grow, you won't take risks, you won't develop. You'll stay stagnant. Belonging carries the idea of community or a family. When you belong in a family, it's important, or a community. We all need to feel part of a tight-knit tribe. And that's what we pray Sheology becomes for you, that this is a place for you to belong, a place for you to feel safe, a place where you know sisters have your back. 
instead of stabbing you in the back. They're calling you up. They're not calling you out. These are basic principles of sheology. And then the last thing is significance. Significance different from belonging. Significant means you matter as an individual. That you know you might be in the same boat, but you've got a job to do that's special that's different perhaps than someone else's job. You bring something to the table. And we all want to feel significant. Dictionary.com defines de significance as the quality of being worthy of attention. Do you ever feel like, hey, me, over here, over here. We want to give you attention. We want you to be significant. The other thing is to be important. I call it the look at me word. Mom, look at me. Look, mom, no hands. Mom, watch me go down the slide. I mean, any parent knows this is one of the top things that we need to do with our children. And if I had a nickel for every time Nathan said to me, Look at me, mom. I'd have a second home in Hawaii. Can I get an amen, amen. sister? <laughs> I know Michelle would love that. She loves Hawaii. But that's what we crave. And you know what? God made us that way. It's not wrong to want to be significant. It's actually to matter. You matter. You are important. God has a design for you. You have a purpose. I'd like to say that maybe at Sheology, we can be the mistresses of mattering. Because if you let someone else know they matter, do you know how important that is? That you notice a smile. You notice a job well done. You notice the clerk who just checks you out so quickly, and you're like, you matter. That we are, just lift our eyes up and see the people around us. It's you mattering. The truth is that we all want to be accepted for who we are. There's the caveat, right? Not the person you want me to be. Not the person your mother wanted you to be. Not the person your peers want you to be. But on no makeup days, messy house days, rotten attitude days <laughs> because sadly we've learned to wear so many masks we're afraid to let them down why rejection so we put on a mask of who we think you want us to be instead of being liberated to be the the person that we are created and for most of us to be rejected for our true selves is a devastating blow and that's why we put on the masks to begin with. At some point, we wonder, where is that happy-go-lucky little girl and who replaced her with the ice queen? Can you feel me? You feel me? Sometimes you feel yourself being someone you are not genuinely at the core and you want that little girl to come out. It's like, can Lenya come out and play? Because she's fun when she gets to come out and play. I love the scene in the movie, The Help. Did you guys see that or read the book? Books better always. But I love it where the nanny, Abilene Clack, wants baby Mae Mobley to remember, you is kind, you is smart, and you is important. And don't we all that want that? Maybe you could just turn to someone tonight and say, you is kind, you is smart, and you is important because that's the truth. And I love that nanny. That poor little girl was getting just beat up and abused and ignored by her mama. And I think if it wasn't for that person in her life, she may never have known how significant she really was. We're all in search of significance or purpose or the reason we exist. And I propose to figure that out we go back to the garden. The garden of even where God made man and woman on purpose and for a purpose. It says in Genesis 2 verse 8 that the Lord God had planted a garden in the east in Eden and there he formed 
humans. He formed them. If you'll indulge me, I think that you're a wildflower and that God planted you in his garden to be that amazing wildflower, the one that you're supposed to be. And maybe you keep trying to be a hot house debutante rose, and God's made you to just be a plain old daisy. <laughs> and there's nothing wrong with that, because we should just be what God made us to be. Lightheartedly, because we said wildflowers, I thought it'd be fun to name a few flowers Um, I went to like an FDD website, you know, one of those florists, and they said, rose people have a quiet, traditional exterior, but inside they're passionate and deep. In touch with their emotions, rose people can sometimes be standoffish with their thorns to protect them. Despite their tough facade, rose people are extremely caring. They champion their friends seeking the best for them. Roses, anybody a rose? It's okay, yes, good for you. Okay, orchid people. Orchid people love luxury. (laughs) Susan, I don't know, you might be an orchid. I'm not sure. They have a mysterious, dynamic personality that charms other people. Orchid people care about appearance, and although other people clamor for their attention, Orchid people have a very small circle of close friends. Relationships are quality, not quantity. Any orchids out there? Okay, thank you. I think you're beautiful. Tulip people, Francesca. (laughs) Tulip people are the life of the party. These sensitive, intuitive people are incredibly positive, lighthearted, and caring. Tulip people are well-liked and ready enough to bring people together. Tulip people love new experiences and are excited about life. That excitement is contagious, and they have lots of friends. Tulip people, come on, you extroverts. Now is your chance. <laughs> Iris people. Iris people are optimists with unbound imagination. They can seem distracted, but they are true to their word and very loyal friends. They're a little mystical and they enjoy meditation and quiet reflection. They desire truth above all else. Any irises out there? You're feeling the iris. All right. Well, see, that's my point. We can be a garden of friends We can be the wildflowers. We can create a bouquet, and we don't have to be the same. We can be who God made us to be. Now, the flowers I just mentioned are garden flowers. In other words, they're usually highly tended, and the kind of flower we want to highlight are wildflowers. Britannica.com says that these are any flowering plant that has not been genetically manipulated and grows without human aid. So you find them in woodlands and mountains and prairies, usually the untrodden places. It's so beautiful. Jesus loves wildflowers. Did you know that? In Luke 12, 27, he said, look how the wildflowers grow. They don't work or make clothes for themselves, But I tell you, not even King Solomon, with all his wealth, had clothes as beautiful as these flowers. Maybe you're a wildflower, and I love that idea. This study in wildflowers is meant to help you find your significance, because we don't all have to be the same. We're going to highlight lesser-known women in the New Testament to see how vital they were to God. Because you know what? Unnoticed does not mean unimportant. And you may never have studied some of these women. You may not even know their names. But I promise you that God knew them. And perhaps he took these ordinary women on extraordinary adventures to show What a wonderful God he is. So let's look at Dorcas the Daisy, and that's in Acts chapter 9. In Acts chapter 9, we're introduced to Dorcas. Verse 29, 
it says, let me find it. Oh, no, 36, sorry. At Joppa, there was a certain disciple named Tabitha, which is translated Dorcas. This woman was full of good works and charitable deeds that she did. But it happened in those days that she became sick and died. When they had washed her, they laid her in an upper room. And since Lydda was near Joppa, and the disciples had heard that Peter was there, they sent two men to him, imploring him not to delay in coming to them. Then Peter arose and went with them. When he had come, they brought him to the upper room, and all the widows stood by weeping, showing the tunics and garments which Dorcas had made while she was with them. But Peter put them out, knelt down, and prayed. And turning, he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes. When she saw Peter, she sat up. Then he gave her his hand and lifted her up. And when he had called the saints and widows, he presented her alive. And it became known throughout all Joppa, and many believed on the Lord. That's Dorcas. Well, my first point about Dorcas is that she's fresh as a daisy. And she's fresh as a daisy would be she does good. Part of her significance is found in what she does, and we're introduced that she is full of good works and charitable deeds that she does. Now, Dorcas is a Greek name. Tabitha is an Aramaic name, but both of them are translated to mean gazelle. So you just picture her super graceful, right? That's what I think. Joppa was a bustling port city with trade ships from all over the world. So there were lots of people from lots of countries that spoke lots of languages. And no doubt, Dorcas went by Tabitha and Dorcas, and she was bilingual. Just probably part of surviving in that port city was being able to get to know people of other places and languages. Now, daisies exude joy. I mean, look at that. It's just happy, right? You see a daisy and you can't help. These cheerful flowers are known for their yellow center and surrounding white petals. The Celts believe that they represented innocence and purity. And I think Dorcas is that to a T. How beautifully she was spreading joy with her good deeds and her wonderful giving. Good works, listen to me now, if you're looking for significance, this is important. You might want to memorize this verse, underline this verse. One reason that you were created is for good works. If you don't know your meaning, your purpose, your significance, this is it. Paul said in Ephesians 2 verse 10, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. Why did God create you? For good works. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. Get this. The good works that you are supposed to do, it says, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. In other words, God has so created you for good works that he actually prepared the good works you were due before you were born. Can you wrap your head around that? Good works. If you're not feeling significant, I would start with some good works because that is going to put you on the map because God made you for that. You were created for a purpose-driven life life to do good works. And you know what else is cool about that verse? We are his workmanship, Ephesians 2.10. Workmanship comes from a Greek word that is poema, which literally means work of art. God created you to be a work of art, and your good works are his brush strokes that you would have the light so shine in you that they would glorify your Father in heaven. I get tingles with that. It's where we get the English word 
poem. <laughs> you might say, when you are performing good works, your poetry in motion. Oh, it's so good. Doesn't it make you want to do good works? Good works, listen to me, don't have to be big and flashy. Because all of us think, I'm ready for the big thing, God. Just show me when the big thing comes. When I'm getting in the big leagues, God. Come on, I'm ready for the big works. I'm ready. And that's not at all what it's like in Scripture. The widow of Zarephath gave bread to the hungry. Martha opened her home with hospitality to Jesus and the disciples. Mary Magdalene gave her bottle of perfume to be fragrant on the feet of Jesus. The unnamed widow who was poor put her two mites in the offering for the poor. And Dorcas used a needle and fabric to care for widows and provide their clothing. These are little things, but they're big in God's hand, aren't they? They're good works. When God said to Moses, what's in your hand? When he wanted to deliver the children of Israel, Moses said, a rod. What did that rod do, y'all? It turned into a snake. It opened the Red Sea. That rod did so many things. And you might say, when God came to Dorcas and said, Dorcas, what's in your hand? She said, a needle. What's in your hand? What's in your hand? With that needle, she made clothes, garments for widows, more unnoticed people. She noticed the unnoticed. She made them garments. And you might say she clothed Jesus. How do I know that? Matthew 25, 34. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. And the righteous will say to him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? Or when did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will say, assuredly do I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Right. When you do good works, you do them to Jesus, for Jesus. What's in your hand? Let me tell you about this beautiful woman. I love her so much. Her name is Champelle Anderson. Every weekday after working a full shift for her whole health care, 40-year-old Champel comes home to make lunches for the neighborhood kids whose parents can't even afford to give them a sandwich. She sets up a table in her front of her house with bags with PB&Js, chips, and fruit, and a sign that says, Champ's Teardrops. Did they put her up here? Ah! Oh my gosh. Why? She said her friend's kids kept coming to her house after school hungry. And when she'd seen them begging at a gas station, she knew she needed to do something. Anderson loves her neighborhood, and she wants the people to take care of each other, even though it's poverty-stricken and infested with drugs. This mother of six, in some cases, doesn't just make lunch, but gives breakfast to the kids. And sometimes if the kids come over late, because the only meal was lunch, she gives them dinner too. What is in your hand? A peanut butter and jelly sandwich? I mean, surely God can use you. So that's fresh as a daisy doing good works. The next thing is she forms a daisy chain, which I call she disciples others. It says it happened in those days that she became sick and died. When they had washed her, they laid her in an upper room, and since Lydda was near Joppa, 
the disciples had heard that Peter was there, they sent two men to him, imploring him not to delay. Did you know that daisies grow in clusters? They grow in clumps. And that's what I like to think of Dorcas and her friends. They are a clump of daisies. And whatever one does, the other one does. They have the motto like the musketeers, one for all and all for one. And as a clump, they get a lot done, don't they? Whatever these ladies did, they did together. You want to know why? There is power in we. You can't do it alone. There's power in we. Jesus said in Matthew 18, 20, for there, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst. Two or more are gathered. Jesus is there with you. Dorcas is the only woman in scripture to be called a disciple. Woo, come on, you females, let the women arise. If Dorcas can be a disciple, so can I. She was running with the big dogs when she got that title. Disciple simply means a student, a learner, or a pupil. One who learns from another and maintains those principles and acts them out. Sounds like a Christian, doesn't it? That's what a disciple is. Discipleship is the process of becoming who Jesus would be if he were you. You got me? Discipleship is the process of becoming who Jesus would be if he was you. If you could embody Jesus, that's what a disciple is. Skip and I, <clears throat> when we were newly married, we lived next door to this couple that were new to town from California. And they didn't know anyone, and quickly after her honeymoon, she got pregnant, and I felt so sorry for her, so I offered to throw a shower for her, inviting my friends. What good friends? That they would come to the shower and give gifts to Pam. And it was just so beautiful. And you know, that was 34 years ago, 35 years ago. I bumped into her last week, and she said, the nicest thing that anyone ever did for me was to throw me that shower when I didn't know anyone here. And I just hope someday I can return that favor to somebody else. Discipleship, what do you have in your hand, in your house, in your life? Christian simply means to be Christ-like. And I want you to be disciples. I would love you to be disciples of Jesus. I'd love you to be disciples of Sheology, that you could be like Paul, follow me as I follow Christ. But the truth is, you can't make someone be a disciple. They have to choose. Over 20 times, Jesus said in Scripture, follow me, follow me, follow me. And do you know how many turned away and didn't follow him? You get the choice. You can choose to follow Jesus you can choose to be a clump with us daisies, and we can walk this road together. Now, what I love about Dorcas is I think she instituted a draft with these daisies, right? It includes the widows and the women who followed her. A lot of people started following her, and they stuck with her, frankly, after she was sick and dead. That's pretty Amazing. Did you know that daisies, like sunflowers, follow the sun? From sun up to sun down. And I had a little clip I wanted you to see. Don't you love that? I want to be a clump of daisies and follow Jesus with my friends. So these friends, what did they do? First of all, they washed her, which I'm sure was ritual. You know, it was the cleansing for burial. But I also believe it was emotional because we see that they were crying when Peter came and holding up the garments. All the widows stood by weeping. They valued her life by mourning her loss. You know, you can know the value of someone if you go to their funeral, right? 
and you know who loved that person. Paul spoke of washing people in the word. It says, Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her with the washing of the water of the word. Make sure you bathe the people you love in tears and wash them in God's word. The next thing they did is they laid Dorcas in an upper room. Isn't that place rich with meaning? When you hear upper room, what do you think of? It's where Jesus had the last supper with his disciples. But not only that, after the, re after the resurrection, the disciples were in the upper room when the tongues of fire of the Holy Spirit fell on them. They put her in the upper room. What do you think that means? Is this a place of faith? They put her in a place of faith. You know what? They weren't preparing for a funeral. They were preparing for a resurrection. Amen? I love the faith of these ladies. To me, upper room represents intimacy with Jesus. And they honored her by putting her in a sacred place. So beautiful. Jesus said, the true test of being a disciple is love in action. John 13, 34 says, a new commandment I will give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Listen, by this, all will know you are my disciples if you love one another. Are you looking for significance? Do good. Looking for significance, be a disciple. Be a disciple. Follow hard after Jesus and love people like Jesus would love people. And you will feel significant. And so will the people you love, right? Pope Francis said, being a disciple means being constantly ready to bring the love of Jesus to others. And this can happen unexpectedly in any place, on a street, in a city square, during work, or on a journey. Again, it doesn't have to be the big thing. You know, one time I was standing in the grocery store, and it was an inner city grocery store, not the highfalutin Trader Joe's or Sprouts or whatever, and I saw a man with a daughter, and he couldn't speak English, so he was having the daughter translate, and they didn't have very many groceries, and they had to put away her like RC Cola, not even name brand, and a candy bar because it wasn't going to be afforded. And the Lord said, you pay for that. You pay for what they're doing. Now, it might not have made a huge difference, but I said, Jesus told me to pay for your food. Can you tell your dad that for me? Do you know how many little things you can be doing with what's in your hand? Just open up your eyes. The third point is upsy-daisy, because after her death, she was death-defying, right? Verse 40, but Peter put them all out and knelt down and prayed, and turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up. Then he gave her his hand and lifted her up, and when he had called the saints and wind widows, he presented her alive. According to Nordish mythology, daisies represent a new beginning since they're harbingers of the spring after a long, dark, dormant winter. Is anybody here in a winter? You know if you're in a winter because you're looking for a down coat. You're looking for comfort anywhere you can. Following this analogy, Dorcas suffered the dark night of the soul with sickness and death. And if you've been with anyone who's lost someone, it feels so dark. It feels so alone. I take comfort knowing that even stellar Christians like Dorcas, who is called a disciple, suffered. Because sometimes we're not honest enough to talk about the times that we have suffered. When I was diagnosed with stage three endometrial cancer, my treatment led to baldness, bowel issues, and really bad days. And the Bible doesn't sugarcoat the suffering of saints. And Dorcas had her fair share, and so will you. But God is there with you. He knows sometimes it's dark. 
Do you know, before every resurrection comes a death. You want to say that with me? Before every resurrection comes a death. Has something died in your life? Is there death in your life? It may not be literal like Dorcas or Lazarus. Maybe it's death of a career, the end of a marriage, the demise of a treasured dream, an empty womb. Something in your life feels dead. Dorcas can relate. You know, years before I had endometrial cancer, I had endometriosis, a severe case, and I had to have a hysterectomy. This part of me has just never been very friendly. It's been an ongoing issue, trust me. And I lost the greatest female trait of all, giving birth. But God made a promise to me that was so profound that time. When this happened, I was driving down the street, and a song came on the radio by Fernando Ortega, and it was this verse in it, John 12, 24. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He who is, loves his life will lose it. But he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. And I remember saying, amen, who are you? I'm with you. I'm with you. Because it hurts to lose. It hurts to die. It hurts to be sick. It hurts to hurt. It just does. But you know what? Dorcas had these friends that didn't give up on her. Even when they washed her and laid her in an upper room, they weren't giving up on her. Are you living through a dying season, a time of tears, days of drought, days of doubt? Let us clump around you like the friends of Dorcas and remind you that daisies are perennials, which means they come up year after year. You might be going down and you might be in the dirt, but you're coming back up. I promise you're coming back up. It's a perennial. Now, I don't know why perennials keep coming up and annuals are one and done, but I kind of like the idea of being a perennial that I want to keep coming up no matter what. For some reason, botanists call them cold, hardy plants meaning they can survive winter and come back to bloom another day. Amen? Someone grab it onto that? That's a promise for you. You can bloom another day. It's not over. It's not over. It's just winter. But what comes after winter? Springtime. Um, three things that Peter does that were faith-filled in this time is, number one, he dismiss, dismisses the crowd. They're all there crying and showing her clothes. And he's like, get out of here. I'm, to me, I don't know about you, but I've never raised anyone from the dead. And if I came in a room and that's what they thought I was going to do, I'm like, y'all, come on, let's lay hands. Let's defer this. You know, if it's not my faith, maybe, maybe somebody else. And, and so he tells them, go away. Ooh, that's stack of the odds. He'd never done this before. But this must have been private. It was between two disciples, one dead and one very much alive. And he was ready for Jesus and the promise. John 14, 12. I tell you the truth. Anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do greater things than these. Um, who's that promise for? Anyone who believes in me. That includes you and me. And you know what? Afterwards, the leadership team is coming up here with anointing oil. And if you came here and you want to be prayed for and have hands laid on you, we believe in a God who raises from the dead. You can take that to the bank. Amen? Second thing is he kneels down. I like that because kneeling is a humble attitude, right? It reminds us that he can't do anything. He, he's hoping God's going to do everything, right? 
That's a good posture. And number three, he prays two words. There's no fasting. There's no fretting. There's no long, loquacious, yay, Jesus, I call on thee, the master and creator of heaven and earth. There's none of that bloviating. He just goes, Tabitha, arise. <laughs> How many of you have been praying those kind of prayers and they're not really going very far? It just takes two little words and the promises of Jesus Christ, of course. Hear me now. You will live forever if you're a Christian. Yes. Amen? Woo! You're living forever. Forever. And what is to come is better than your best day ever. Right? Your future includes quality of life, not just quantity of life. Imagine this with me. Your peak physique. Yeah? Perfect complexion. Lots of energy. Personal equilibrium, meaning emotionally you're stable. Can I get an amen? Yes. <laughs> A positive outlook. Praising God night and day. You are going to live forever. You're a daisy and you're coming back up. Just like Dorcas, our earthly bodies are made of dust and they will return to dust. But our eternal bodies will be raised in indescribable glory. You are a death-defying daisy. Amen. 1 Corinthians 15, 42, Paul wrote, So also is the resurrection of the dead. This body is sown in corruption, it's raised in incorruption. It's sown in dishonor, it's raised in glory. It's sown in weakness, it's raised in power. It's sown a natural body, it's raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there's a spiritual body. And so it is written, the man, first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, and afterwards the spiritual. The first man was of the earth, made of dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven and was, I'm sorry, the Lord of heaven, and was the man of dust. And so those who are made of dust, and as he is the heavenly man, so also those who will be heavenly. You're dust now, but you're going to be heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the man of dust, so we shall bear the image of the heavenly man. Oh, that's such good stuff. I mean, that's underlining stuff. I haven't read that in a long time. Do you know, um, last semester we had a daisy in our midst. Um, Sailor, I don't know where she went. Sailor, we, I was talking about this first studies, Dark as the Daisy, and she's on our team, and she goes, wait, did you pick Daisy? Did you know it was going to be Daisy before you did this study? And I go, well, yes and no. I knew we were doing Dorcas, but then I had to study flowers and figure out what flower Dorcas was. And then I thought she was a Daisy. And she goes, there was a Daisy last semester. I go, really? She goes, yeah. I was by the bonfire. Remember, we put prayers, lead us not into temptation in the bonfire. And there was a lady crying by the bonfire. And I went over and I said, are you okay? And she spoke broken English and said, do you translate this into Spanish? And she knows, but please come in any way. You're going to love it. Afterwards, I think during the service, God gives Sailor a word for Daisy. So she's looking for Daisy at the bonfire afterwards. And I just love Sailor. She's praying over her and saying, God's going to bring your creativity back. And he's going to do this. And he's going to do that. And the woman says, I feel the spirit. I feel the spirit here. And um, she says, well, I did have creativity. I made bracelets. But my wrist is sore and I can't make bracelets. She texts Sailor that week and says she's healed. Wow. So y'all, there was a Daisy here and she got healed. That's all I'm saying. And then um, the next time she came and brought her mom, the next time she came, she brought her friends. The next time she came, see, you know what was happening in her life was real because she kept coming and she kept bringing other people because she wanted them to see good works and discipleship 
and death-defying faith. Amen? Amen? Woo!